verse 10, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And it says, and behold, <laughs> there was a woman which had a spirit of affirmity 18 years and was bowed together and in can no wise or no way lift up herself. Yes. Now, basically, affirmity is weakness. Brother Lord, she had a spirit of weakness. It's somewhat plausible, and, and I don't want to be Captain Obvious this morning, that she was probably placed there by, pe by people that carried her. Verse 12, and when Jesus saw her, see, most times in life when there's issues in our life, people just kind of want to pass you off. But Jesus says, bring him to me. called her to him and said unto her woman thou art loosed from thine infirmity he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God yes. Yes. why do you worship in church the crooked has been made straight. That's right. Amen. Amen. The messed up has become a miracle. Amen. Amen. The imperfect has just gotten closer to the perfect. Amen. Amen. We don't come in here and put on suits to feign perfection. No, we do that in honor of the one who's called us to him. That we might come out of darkness into his marvelous light. I'm thankful for a God that can be touched with the feelings of my infirmities and my struggles and understand my daily problems when, when maybe I'm not at the best with my wife or my children or my church or even God. And in my weakness, he calls me. I want to talk for a few moments on the subject, when my condition puts me in the right place. When my condition puts me in the right place. Jesus, we thank you. If you can place your bottles down. Jesus, we thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. Lord, I ask for your unction and your help today that I could somehow, some way, convey to these people that you love right now how much you love, how much you care, and how much you want and can do in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, and all the believers said amen. amen. You could be seated. Hallelujah. This lady, in her condition, surrounded by healthy people that got there, probably under their own steam. People probably put out that they had to maybe walk around her or maybe res respect the spot that she was placed in. The broken lady became the blessed lady. Right. You know, many times we miss how things work. And Sister Erica touched on something awesome when she touched about how it's the brokenness that God uses to, to bless and to bring out the beautiful things in life. And uh, I don't know about you, and I, I'm not big into it, but I like, I like cologne. 
I like it when other people wear cologne. <laughs> In fact, recently, uh, we've been talking about that, some of us around here. I, can't, I couldn't afford to be some people around here. When you go through a bottle of cologne in two weeks, I'm like, whoa. Uh, let me teach you to go buy the cheap stuff. <laughs> You're going to be in the poor house the rest of your life. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll tell you what I do. You know, Sherry, sure, I'll be honest with you. I'll run down there to that store where you get, it's the knockoff stuff. Knock off stuff. It, got the, it says right there, like, and it'll say whatever. I'm not trying to give a plug for anything. But. And so I, you ask my wife, she'll tell you. She'll tell people. He wears that cheap knockoff stuff during the day. I do. But when we're going out, yeah. Come on, sweetheart, you're going to get the. Real, so I'm going to put the money out in the right stuff for you, right? You know, if, if, I'm, if you and I, and I've, I've been to dinner with pretty much everybody, I'll get you guys. We're going to go. We're going to go to Olive Garden meet for lunch. I'm going to put on the real thing, you know? Blue edition now. Versace blue. Antonio, what do you to go to. Come on. That is solid. It's timeless. You can count on it. It's like that car that starts every time. It works. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'd ask Brother Corey, but it's got to change from week to week because he's got to buy it from week to week. <laughs> Sister Crow, she's got hers. I tried to convert her to a couple others, but She's got her mainstay. When I smell that smell, she instantly comes to mind. I tell you mine, but it's, it's, it's humorously unbiblical. I'm a pastor, and some of you may not be able to navigate that, so keep it to myself. But anyway, you don't get a really good perfume without some florals, beautiful flowers, or something crushed to get the essence out of it. Some of you sitting here today, maybe you've been marred or crushed by some trials, but that's what gives you the essence and the beautifulness of who and what you are. It's the honesty that you have some brokenness. Isn't that what attracts us to Jesus? He was broken for us. He bled for us. That's a wondrous attraction for me, Isaiah, the prophet, makes a statement. And I will bring the blind by the way they knew not. And I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. I've gotten sidewalked. I've gotten things messed up. I've uh, had my opinions and ideologies kind of askew from God. In fact, there was a young man that Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, spoke to, and he makes this statement to him because there are times even the best of us misstep, get carnal, said, wherefore I put thee in remembrance, Timothy, that thou stir up the gift of God. Now, see, I'm, I'm going to be passing for it. Some of you stir up your spirit at the drop of a hat. Don't look back at me like you don't know who I'm talking about. Don't look back at me like you don't think I know. In other words, you haven't been stirred up before? You didn't. You probably come to church, someone crossed, crossed in front of you. You were stirred up right then. Mm -hmm. She took a little too long in the bathroom. You're stirred up. She used your brush, your comb. 
toothbrush. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting personal now. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. We have got to be more prone to doing that than be stirred up in our human spirit and go even more sideways from God. Which is in thee by the putting on my hands. For God hath not given us a, a, the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We ask God right now, God, we want the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. I want the gift of God stirred up in me. I, I want to be a God chaser. I want to pursue the things of God. Holy Ghost, move in this house right now and move on somebody that we can stir up the things of God in our life. In our text, it's a situation that demonstrates the powerful side of Jesus. I said that because too many people still picture Jesus crucified and bleeding on a cross. So we have Jesus dealing with a couple of issues here. Religious people, people that really desire Jesus. There's a difference. It's just had a brief discussion that deals with the judgmental attitude of the Pharisees. They're religious. You're religious, and you're, you're so full of arguments. You're, you, you sit there unresponsive to the move of God, but your mind has not stopped arguments. Are you, anybody be honest? You're in a conversation with someone, and then in your mind, you're, eh. well, you do that sitting here with God. When it's time to worship, you sit there. When it's time to praise, you sit there. When it's time to amen, you sit there. When it's time to come to the altar, you sit there. It's not that you're not doing nothing. Your mind is consumed with an argument or an idea to never respond to the Spirit of God because you're engulfed with a spirit of weakness. <laughs> you're strong in the things of the world. You're powerful in stuff that don't matter. No one would challenge you in this or that, but when it comes to the spirit of God, well, I ain't heard from him. I don't know what he wants to do. I don't. What Jesus is, is, is dealing with here is like, you know what, if something bad happens to you, it doesn't mean that you sin. If everything's going wonderful, it doesn't mean that you haven't sinned. <laughs> He's basically saying it doesn't matter who or what you've been. No matter what's happened in your life, good or bad, if you're blessed, if you're messed up, we all have to come to a place of repentance. Mm, what, a power, what a powerful understanding right here. Every one of you that are together right now, there's an element of repentance the element of being able to say sorry already that comes with the package. Because you come in understanding, okay, I'm flawed. I can't expect perfection from them because they're not going to get it from me. But we still need to repent because we're in a relationship with the one that is perfect. Does this make sense? We all need God and repentance is the understanding that I need God. If you don't think you need to repent, you're basically saying, I need God. I'm bad all by myself. I got this. I, I am the epitome of Jesus Christ walking in shoe leather today. When I walk into the church, I am the power of God. I am the word of God. I am. But repentance pulls all that heals all that away. There's, if Sister Crow and I have been fighting, we, we argue, we don't agree on everything. It happens. But the moment it releases the power of unity. It releases the power of the two of us coming together. 
it, it brings an intimacy. It brings powerful. It brings a closeness. It, it, it causes the relationship to thrive. So when it comes to God, in order to have that, 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 that bubbling, growing, thriving, powerful relationship, we walk in a place of repentance with God. Are you hearing me? So we have, to, we have to understand that there's an element of forgiveness that we need from God. <laughs> Bible says in Acts 17 and 30, and at times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. Repentance is not something we shy away from, like the plague. It's not something you got to hide from. It is an open door to God. Flaws and all, he's going to let me in because I'm sorry for my shortcomings. Forgiveness is one of the most powerful tools God has handed humanity. John 9 and 31 says something. And I, if you have your Bibles, you need, to, you need to mark this. You need to highlight this. You need John 9 and 31. Listen to this. Now we know that God, this is going to freak you out. You ready for just a little two-minute Bible study? God heareth not sinners. He just said he came for sinners. <laughs> but if any man be a worshiper, of God and doeth his will. He hear, in other words, that place of repentance placed God in the right place of worship. That makes sense? Repentance is the difference between a believer and a sinner. I have sin in my life, but I'm a believer. I'm not perfect. I'm still a believer. I'm trying to follow Jesus. There's issues but I'm still a believer because I live a repentant life. Repentance is, is our recognized need of God. Am I making sense this morning? Re repentance is a understanding that we are indeed flawed no matter how good we think we are or have been. Are you hearing me? When you think about Jonah and Nineveh, David in Psalms 51, Zacchaeus the tax collector, blind Bartimaeus, Paul who was Saul, Moses, and, and all these crooked, broken people, troubled people in bad situations. If God's mercy had not been available to them in their story, all of them would have been tragic. Moses' story would... They would never have made a movie about the Prince of Egypt. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It would have been the idiot in Egypt. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We wouldn't be telling children about the story of David and Goliath. It would have been the story of Goliath stomp David. God for God's divine intervention. Thank God for the mercy that's available to the crooked people, the messed up people. Thank God for the miraculous intervention of God. You have to be careful when Jesus is talking because, and I live with a teacher, I married a teacher, they're always teaching. Jesus was a teacher. When you're reading, you have to stop and understand if he's speaking, he's teaching. Because God loves, God teaches. You'll find a parent is always teaching. You're always teaching. I was kind of cracking up. Brother Ooh was talking the other day. He was already trying to teach his son to sing. How old is he? A month? Is it ever too soon to get started? Every parent knows you want to teach them quick. You got to get them out of the diaper so you can stop doing that. You want to be big boy, put on big pants. Oh, yeah, you go party all by yourself. Yeah, because you're teaching. No matter who, where, or what you are, God has something for you. Because God has something for you. Every one of us knows that if there's younger people in your life, 
you're teaching and dealing with and you're watching because there's things you want to do for them. But until they learn a certain level of understanding, you can't give them some things. There has to be an element of God trusting you with it because he doesn't want you to hurt. There was a time in my son's life, he wanted to mow the yard and he wanted to weed eat. And I said, no, I want you to go play. Go play. Because there was a day I was not only going to teach him how to do it, he was going to have to do it. I remember when he wanted to drive. You know what I taught him to do before I ever taught him? To, I taught him how to change a tire. Well, that's mean. Really? What good is being able to drive if every time something happened, you couldn't fix the problem? See, that's the problem. Some of us want things from God that you're not prepared to handle. Mm -mm. That's why whenever you come, come, come to a hard place, you stop and go no further because you're refusing to listen, to listen and learn the lesson to be able to handle to go further. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So our text says that he's teaching in a synagogue on the Sabbath. He's, while he's teaching, he notices a woman. I'm not told how she got there. But somehow she became the focus of his attention. There's a lot of people there, but he focused on her. Can I say that maybe right now, God is looking at each and every one of us and he sees that issue. The struggle, that weakness, that handicap, that disability. On her side, from her purview, it's obvious that at this point, if Jesus is speaking and she's in proximity, I'm pretty sure she was intrigued at the possibilities that Jesus brought with him. Maybe you're here today and you're not fully convinced, but the concept of a possibility or even a plausibility that if you got close to Jesus or if you got his attention, something could change in your life. When you understand his reputation, she had to be interested. And possibly at this point, she may have told those that carried her, listen, he's going to be sitting right here. It's already been said. I heard it all. I want you to put me right in the front row. Put me there and take my crooked life, my crooked carcass, my messed up mind, my spirit away, and put me right in front of Jesus. No. I guess if you're already that far messed up, why try to hide in the crowd? So here she is, crippled lady, completely hindered by her greatest need. She couldn't move physically on her own. She was stuck. Life had come to a standstill. The NIV says it this way in Luke 13, 11, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit. People like to always blame something outside of them. They come and go, they vacillate, they just, they're wishy-washy. One minute, they believe God, the next can we be real? She'd been crippled by spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Mm -hmm. She was crippled. You know I'm using that. How many times you've been told to straighten up? I always I thought my name was straighten up till I figured out what my dad was saying. <laughs> uh, 
I didn't have a pancakes chance in a frying pan, you know, in my life until my dad, I'm telling you. You ever been around folks who just can't seem to straighten themselves up? I really doubt anything wonderful could step in life to distract her away from her issue, from her condition. 18 years is a long time to deal with something. 18 years is, well, ask anybody 17 how long 18 years is. <laughs> but this day, I believe Jesus was able to distract her from that one thing that just kind of invaded and overtook her life, the idea that the healer was nearby, that the one that could fix whatever problem I have is right in front of me. God is looking for those who admit they need him. <laughs> if, if those that are not sick don't need a physician. But if you're willing to admit here you have a need, if you're willing to say, you know what, God can do some things for me. There are some things in my life that if I would quit blaming the pastor and quit blaming the church building and quit blaming the programs and quit blaming the you know what, I need a good touch of the master to heal, to fix my spirit of weakness. I need God. God seeks out those who will let him. Now, she may have been just another face in the crowd to everybody else, but that wasn't what she was to Jesus. She had something that caught the master's eye. She had a story that needed a miracle. That was a divine moment, not for her, but for Jesus. Oh, yes. How many of us have friends or family or acquaintances that come to us with a problem and on the inside you're like, you know what, I can help that. Nobody? You see, we were made in the likeness and the image of God. But the problem is we become American-minded and we lose that generosity. We're trying to keep up with Joneses, but Jones instead of walking with Jesus. Well, I may not get it back. Well, nobody will know I've, I've done it. But whatever it takes, you know? And then there's those that are like Jesus. What do you mean you ain't got problem with me? Isn't that what Jesus did? Anybody here? Had Jesus step in and do something in your life? Anybody here know what it feels like? If we're saved by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, there's someone in here right now that can testify and say, he fixed my crooked cell. Therefore, I recognize I see crookedness and I want to help that. I want to be a part of that. Let me reach out and get my hand in that. This is that divine moment that are intersections between the past and the pain and the faith and future. It is a transition. The present moment is where the past and present collide and God says, let me. It's a defining moment. Today, this simple March Sunday, could be the difference in your life if you will let him touch you. So my question is, are you here to touch Jesus? <laughs> and somehow, this lady 
the most needy probably in the area. See, there's a pattern here. Blind Bartimaeus got his attention because he was the what? The most needy in the area. Come on. Let's be real. We learned it in, well, they learned it in grade school now, but I learned it in high school. You better wear your best to school. You all remember that? I could have had a car way sooner than I got it if I didn't worry about everybody thinking about my Bible once. Do they still wear 501s today? I got all them crazy. They got it. Back then, it was white ones and black ones. Y'all laughing, but I had a I had a pair of white 501s. I probably had two pairs. See, I, I, I lost my dad as a teenager, so I was like, you know, no one's handing me nothing. I went to work. Big dummy, I was riding a bike around long. I should have just went to, I should have went to Kmart. Well, I don't know what brand they sell there. What, what were they called back then? Tough skins or what? I can't remember. Could have been in a car a whole lot sooner. That 69 Ford could have been mine sooner. So worried that I wore the right the right concert shirt. The right jeans. Because you know. Maybe you don't. You know, I couldn't help. I had to do something. I was a geek. I was geek parading around to someone that thought he was cool. Because we always think we have to present an image of completeness. Can I let every can I let us all off the hook? Can I help some of your spouses and friends off the hook? Nobody here in this room is finished. <laughs> You're not finished. I'm not finished. He's not finished working on me. Turn to your neighbor and tell him he's not finished with me. You know why we get bad sometimes? Because our unfinished uh, is exposed. And we act like a jerk. We spout off. Something comes out of our mouth. And we're embarrassed. Because our pride, that spirit of weakness, is exposed. Jesus was surrounded by people in the synagogue. Crowds of po folks, throngs of people, all rushing around trying to get closer to him. The issue that we see here is that the, most of those that surrounded him didn't really desire anything from him. Desire is powerful. Desire is the confirmation that the destination is there. Come on. I was talking to my wife the other night. We remember when we first saw each other. She looking back. <laughs> oh yeah, she looking. <laughs> yeah, she looking. And then, and then, oh no, 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 it gets to bigger than that. A little while later, and, I, and I'm getting old, so I may have the facts. I mean, the con the concepts too, and everything's real. But Dates. Uh, I I ended up preaching because I was evangelizing, preaching around the country, and I was preaching a conference up in a place called Du Bois. Preaching. Man, she showed up there. Oh yeah, she looked good. She's sitting in the back. Oh. Now we know we both look it. <laughs> what is that? Mutual. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Mutual. Desire. Do you hear what's happening? Yeah. Do you hear what's happening with Jesus and this lady? Mutual desire. Mutual. That's probably me. Oh, that's you. Mutual desire. Let Sister Gardner look at each other. Mutual desire. Go ahead. Mutual Wait, wait, where's my girl at? You know. All right. Mutual. 
you imagine what would happen in your life if your desire was focused on the Lord's desire for you? What would happen? Come on. Come on. Amen. 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 There's a miracle about to happen. There is. There's something amazing to take place if you would pursue Jesus like he's pursuing you. You would be on a collision course to the miraculous, to an amazing moment, to a move, to a miracle. When you recognize your need and you desire the answer and you know the answer desires you, you can't stop Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 You know, let me get to the plan of salvation. It's really, really plain. We're all born in sin and shaven in iniquity. What the word says. So our greatest need is salvation. So that's why I read the verse to you that he heareth not sinners. The very first thing we need to do as a sinner or as a person coming to Jesus is what? Repent. Okay. What good is it to really have a desire for someone and they have a desire for you? But you never get married. If you never say the vows. But we're not married, I'm out. <laughs> uh huh. So, some of you got kids out there that in a relationship, you shaking your head. Oh, why is she putting up with he's beating the fire out of her? Why is she putting up with that? She mm. The first order of business with me to come. I'm going to get you in covenant because I want to save you. Because when I save you, then I can do everything for you. I've got to get you out of that condition into this position because in this position, I can do anything I want with your condition. So if you go to Acts chapter 2, if you got your Bible, go to Acts chapter 2. Let me cover this real quick and I'm going to wrap this up. We're going to close this out. Jesus, the number one thing he wants to do, he wants to save us. He wants to save us. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Say amen when you're there. Here he is talking about, Peter is talking. Remember when Peter was given the keys? And Matthew? And the gates of hell? shall not prevail against it. He was, upon this rock, I will build my church. Here's Peter speaking, setting up the church, a us, right now, what we're living right now. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We want forgiveness. We want to be in relationship with God. They're already believers but they needed to be in relationship. What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, forgive me, I want to be in relationship. My condition has placed me in a position where I need you. I want you. I desire you. So I'm going to repent. And then, I'm, I, and then it says, and be baptized every one of you in the name. Everybody say the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. In other words, everything in your past, everything you've done, all the crooked things are washed away. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Everybody gives gifts at a wedding unless you're like watch jump. You're just showing up the reception and the hors d'oeuvres. Hello? Now, I want to cover something because I know as soon as you get this, someone 
comes up with this verse of scripture and they try to work that. But we know who they get baptized in what name? For what? You get baptized in Jesus. Lacey, how do you get baptized? In Jesus' name, right? For the remission of sins. Correct. You know, in Jesus' name. So we have a situation that happened in Matthew 28, 19. Jesus is speaking. There's not a baptismal service, but he's parabolically speaking to find out, do you really understand what it means to be in a relationship with me? Do you really understand how this works, guys? So he says, go ye therefore, starting of the church, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the, of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and of the Holy Ghost. Let me take you to a prophecy in Isaiah to get you to understand. God is a spirit. He doesn't have flesh. God is a spirit. Okay, he, he didn't get up today with a crooked old leg like Pastor Crow. He didn't get up and have all the issues that you had. God's a spirit. Matthew 4 and 24. Go look it up. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's a quote. That's the Bible. He is a spirit. So understand that God had prophesied what he was going to do to create and answer the need that we had for being lost and being sinners. Isaiah 9 and 6 says, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, for unto us a child is born. What's coming up around the corner just, what, three, four weeks? Easter, Easter where we celebrate what? <laughs> the birth of a child and the resurrection from the crucifixion will be bought and paid for us. Yeah. Right here. So we have Christmas and Easter when people go to church. But Christians go to church year round. Keep that happening. <laughs> for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name? Now, see, his name is his name, but these are titles that he's going to be called. Wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. All talking about one God. Are you hearing me? <laughs> In fact, there was a situation where one guy got a little sideways, Philip, in chapter 14 of John in verse 9. Jesus said to him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Acts 4.12 punctuates Acts 2.38 because they're speaking. It says, neither is there salvation. What do we need first? Salvation. How do we get there? Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the wedding present. Right here, what I'm saying? The earnest of your inheritance. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we might, there's no other name to use when you get baptized than Jesus' name, whereby we must be saved. Amen. Make sense? You have to understand, God isn't just interested in throwing little trinkets your way throughout your life. He's not looking for weekend visits, one night stands, or to date you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He's not interested in that. He's looking for a bride. In fact, so much so that he uses a parable about five wise virgins and five foolish virgins. He talks about the bride of Christ. He talks about the wedding. The... You understand what I'm saying? Okay. And I'm going to read one more, one more thing on doctrine, and then I'm going to move on and close out. Because thank God, these people that are already believers were willing to be taught. I think one of the greatest things about a relationship, not only between us and God, but us and each other, is the ability to say, you know what? I can still learn. Right. Right. Look at your spouse and say, baby, 
I can still learn. I can do better. It was that scary. That's how we stay together. And it came to pass, this is Acts chapter 19, 1 through 6. I'm really quick. And it came to pass that while Apollos was a corn, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. No insults here. He said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Have you received the gift since you believe? And they said, and we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. We didn't heard about that. And he said to them, under what were you baptized? Okay, because something was done incorrectly. Something was missed. You can believe and be sincere, but you can still believe and be sincerely wrong. Because God has a way he wants it done. All right? And they said, under John's baptism. Because he asked them, under then were you baptized? Under what then were you baptized? And they said, under John's baptism. Then said Paul, oh, I know where you're at. Let me help you. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. You're a believer, you repent. That's great. Saying it to the people, they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, like he did, Timothy, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Let me expound on this. Are you willing to be unstuck from the doctrine that's held you up from that full, fiery, wonderful, intimate, passionate relationship with Jesus? I don't want to be R rated, X rated, or nothing. Yeah, come on. You remember when you first started liking each other? Falling asleep on the phone together. Couldn't wait to see each other. That slightest touch. <laughs> you know, remember that? Remember when you first started coming to church and speaking a slight move of the Holy Ghost? Yes. <laughs> it's living for God is like being married. You've got to do what you did in the beginning that made it so wonderful to keep it wonderful. You've got to do this. When you come into the house of God, you've got to still come in here. I can't wait to feel his presence. I can't wait to please him and do something that'll set him off. I, I can't. W be willing to be unstuck this morning. Be willing to be retaught. Be willing to say, I want to get back to that amazing experience with God and start. You know what? I, I don't weigh things when I want to give it. If I want to give something to my wife, it doesn't matter what it costs. I want her to know. I told her the other day, she wore this outfit. I was like, you know, forgive me, and I hope this ain't too much to embarrass my wife. I never want to do that. I don't. She wore an outfit, and I said, that's a nice outfit. You look great. You know what? It's too old. You go home, toss it away unless you want to keep it. You take my card, and I want you to go get a couple more replacements. Now, now, that don't make me anything. It makes me normal in a relationship. Stingy people are willing to jeopardize the relationship. Stingy people that, oh, well, you know what? I don't. Ain't nothing worse than a stingy partner. You feeling me? Can I, can I just. What if you knew you were the one Jesus Are you ready? But most of all, are you willing to experience it? If if I told you, and I, I 
if I told you parked outside right now, I have a 1975 Volkswagen Beetle with 350,000 miles, oil leaks, rickety and rusty, or I've got a Ferrari parked in my right next to it. You could choose one. Which would you take? Sight unseen. You know, no, nobody goes, you know, I can't wait to get my Volkswagen Beetle and cruise. Well, maybe you do. Maybe you ate paint chips or dropped on your head. I don't know. But I don't know. It, there's something about getting in a Ferrari or Lamborghini or just something that. No, the ones people touch. If I, if I came in here, and I almost did this today, but I didn't want anybody to be distracted. I, didn't want, I was going to set a table up, and underneath it, I was going to pull it off, and there was going to be a plate with some toast on it. And then right next to it, Brother Lawrence, because I, I thought of you, that I don't know if you'd make it through service. I was going to have 12 or a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. And I was going to ask you, do you want the toast or the donuts? And I'm like, you know. I, I don't have to think about that too long. You know what? Then that crumbly old dry top, man, you better hand me them donuts. We don't question it. So I'm going to ask you, and I don't want to get sidetracked too much here. The psalmist said, oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Why wouldn't you just give this Jesus thing a chance? Why, why wouldn't you allow God to look at you in your crooked, crippled, messed up state and just taste and see what he could do with your life? Why wouldn't you just say, you know what? I'm going to lift my hands and seek him. I want to be touched by him. I want to be full of the Holy Ghost. I want that. I want that. I'm not satisfied with my dry toast and my Volkswagen Beetle if there's a Lamborghini and a box of Krispy Kreme available. I'm not going to let someone tell me there's no fire in a relationship with Jesus when I'm told that there's Holy Ghost and fire available. I'm not going to settle for mainstream Christianity when I can have a Jesus walk naturally. Let's stand. I, I don't want to. I don't want to keep you. The reason. A lot of churches today, including us sometimes, are not powerful. That's what we read in the Bible is because people are more concerned with being analytical than anointed. Their hearts in search of more stuff rather than more savior. You see, church is just another thing in their list of busyness of their life. Mom, those of you that are in relationship, you never want to treat or be treated like you're just a piece of furniture in somebody else's life. How many want to feel that appreciation, that passion, that love that started it all? Can you imagine putting God on the back burner and you're just another piece of furniture in my life? And I'm telling you, today's Christendom has been neutered and made anemic and they pulled the real Jesus out of it, and they've inserted this.
you realize, and let me explain something here, and I'm going to bring this to a close. We're at the synagogue. He's teaching. He calls this lady. And he works a miracle. All the religious folks are more busy complaining. So much so that they missed the miracle. They literally, there's so many today that Jesus wants to touch. There's so many right now. Life has not been what it could be. You don't need more stuff. You don't need more money. You don't need more accolades. You don't need your name and life. What you really need, you know, is my free hater. The one that truly loves me. I'm going to be a better husband if I'm a better Christian. I'm going to be better at everything if I'm better with God. It makes a statement. I die daily. saying is what more can I do for God? (laughs) We, we, there's songs. I climb the highest mountain I'd swim the deepest ocean. Oh, wait a minute. Here's a, new, here's a, more, a newer one coming to my mind. It's about catch a grenade for you. I'm trying to remember some of the gym lyrics that I hear. It's our way of expressing there is nothing I wouldn't do for your love. Can I tell you, Jesus has already done that for you. He's already done it. And right now, he desires a closer walk with everyone here and everyone watching online and listening. And I will listen. He desires a closer walk with you. All it needs to culminate, to bring it together is for us. I desire you back, Jesus. I want you more than anything. I don't want to miss my miracle. I don't want to miss my moments. I wonder if there's someone here today that wants to just step forward. He called her. Listen. I know, hold on. I know you're crippled. I don't want to walk out in front of everybody. Do I really have to walk forward? Sister Crow and I would not be together if somebody didn't step forward. In fact, we wouldn't be together if we both didn't step forward. Well, let me explain to humanity. Jesus has already taken the step. He's already gone to Calvary. He's already paid the price. He's already done it. You know what he's doing? He's just waiting for you to say, I'm in. I'm all in. It said Jesus called it to you. Mm. Her physical healing came when her mental healing happened. The moment he called her, you see, she was hindered by a spirit of infirmity, spiritual weakness. The physical crippledness came from her spiritual. If you don't get this today, you're going to have to see me after church. I'll tell you, if you get this today, the only thing stopping you from stepping forward to a closer walk with Jesus Okay, 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 hold on, hold on up. I don't know if this is theologically 
doctrinally sound. Okay. Because I know there'll still be people sitting in their seats. And because we've relegated church to tickle my ears, prove God's love all over again, even though I know about Calvary. There's a little verse in Mark chapter 5, verse 15. And they came to Jesus and they saw him that was possessed with the devil and had a legion talking about that joker that was in the tombs I'm talking that guy was rattling chains and freaking everybody out and they tried sitting and clothed and in his right mind They were afraid. Not the man that just been delivered. He wasn't afraid to be. If you want to be delivered, you won't be afraid to come forward. If you really love, you're not going to be afraid. I get it's like a wedding. I don't know if I want to walk down. You ready to make that walk? Oh. You ready to take on the name? Oh. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe we've just gotten too dignified. And like I said, we've made hypocrites comfortable and sinners unwelcome. We've made church more about how you look and how you feel than how you live. Because it's a whole lot easier to put on a nice dress and a suit than it is to put on Christ. The only alteration some of us have allowed in our lives has been at the seamstress and not in an altar. Yeah. 